Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see your shining faces behind your mask and all in our places with our shining faces today. And we welcome you to our assembly at the Emporia Avenue Church, Wichita, Kansas. We welcome those who join us online. We realize that your number is probably decreasing to some extent because more and more churches are opening and so you are finding that you can go back to the ones who are listening today as we are live, maybe already in worship and their home churches. We've enjoyed having all those people and responses that we've had from them but understand their wish to get back as we wish to get back and as our other members who feel more vulnerable have not yet rejoined us. We look forward to the time when we will all be able to be together and today is such a good day to see you more of us have ventured out today and we'll continue to do that lord willing as uh, we have better opportunity today is a day that i would normally be talking about some things related to memorials it's a memorial day weekend and that is a time to appropriately remember recall give thanks for the fact that some people have actually given their lives in foreign fields in battle for the sake of the freedom, the freedom that we enjoy like the freedom of assembly and of worship that we enjoy in our country. We wish never to take them for granted, and I would, under normal circumstances, be addressing such a subject today out of honor for them and because we need to focus on those who've gone before us and the price that has been paid for our freedoms. Today, I feel it's more important to address something that may in fact be more germane to the situation and the time in which we find ourselves, and I hope that will not be interpreted as in any way overlooking or diminishing those and the sacrifice they made, but rather to address the circumstance in which we find ourselves. You locally know that ever since this all began, I've been trying to find lessons that deal with the, the current needs. And I hope that we will continue to do that and we can feel until we feel that we're past the crisis. We're not past it yet. We're still struggling and dealing with some things that I think are very important. And I've been amazed I have to confess to you, I've been amazed at how many ways and how many circumstances are in Scripture that really deal with the issue of when things are not what we call normal, when we are in fact in trouble. Sometimes people, when these kinds of things happen, really find their faith tested. They are, are blindsided in the first place and knocked off balance because they have been taught to expect everything always to be right, ideal, uh, that, that they're going to live happily ever after and there's not going to be any struggles or difficulties or troubles in their life. And when they've been positioned for that kind of life, then for something to happen causes them to, to really get all unsettled and they need reassurance. And we who are in this room aren't really like that. But I think that we'd be a little bit less than thoroughly honest if we said it has not to some extent rattled us and caused us to re-examine our faith and realize that we could be weakened in our faith by the circumstances that exist. Part of that's because people have taught pie-in-the-sky religion and because I'll accuse televangelists, and I don't mean to just pick out them as such, but they are people who sometimes just promise people that if you will just do what I tell you to do, and if you'll send that check, you're going to be blessed forever, and your children will always, they'll all be born pretty, and they'll be healthy, and they'll be smart, and just be sure you send the check, and, and people buy into that, and then when trouble comes, they don't know how to handle it. They're not prepared for it. And they had faith in what a man told them 
that was not consistent with what scriptures say, and now they lose their faith. So I want us to be sure that we understand that our faith is deeper than that and is not contingent on there being a happy ever after, never any trouble coming. It would be implied, if you study scripture, that that would be more than what ought to be expected. I don't know how many passages I ought to cite to begin with. Ones that I have in mind are not new to you. They're not strangers at all. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul said, And all that desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, I read that for a long time, saying all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And then I noted that he gave more detail than that. He said the people who just desire to live godly in Christ Jesus are going to be persecuted. That it'll be common. And so, taking that, we can move to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, where Jesus the Savior is described whenever the writer says, Though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him even jesus had to go through some troubles some trials you reflect on his life in many ways it almost seems that what we know about it was all trouble because from the very beginning satan was going to be opposing him now we've got the insight in the early part of Matthew chapter 4, about the three trials that Jesus withstood at that one onslaught. And Luke iterates that as well. But Matthew says that Satan departed from, uh, from Jesus. Luke says he departed from him for a season or for a more convenient, until a more convenient time. He kept coming. He kept bombarding him all the way through his life. It was he who would even cause the people to turn against him, to rail against him, to, to work to destroy what he was trying to do. It was he who would inspire them to want to crucify him and ultimately to be able to do so. Jesus wasn't left alone by Satan, and his life was not a happy ever after kind of thing for his own time and purposes. He tasted of all the kinds of things that we have to deal with. Maybe not a pandemic exactly like what we've got at this point, but he understands. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 25 says that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities, but who wasn't always tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted, he was tried. He had trouble, but he didn't let it cause his faith and his relationship to the Lord to be in jeopardy at all. What is it that happens to us? I don't know that I can answer that entirely. It does seem like this, that the business as usual, good times that we have enjoyed, and throughout our lives we haven't had anything like this. And so while we've had some things, it hasn't been this. And so we, we get into kind of this mindset that, this is going to continue like this always. That what's happening is the, we call it, normal. And so that's, that's what we can plan on. That's what we are going to have. And then something happens, and, and all at once, instead of singing and being happy and rejoicing, all at once we're kind of, we're Merle Haggard saying, are the good times really over for good? Is this, is this, is that it? Is this as far as it goes? And you're going to be surprised, I was, that I found almost that song in the book of Psalms. And in a few minutes, we're going to go there to one of the Psalms that really deals with dealing with trouble. And it seems to be kind of a five-step plan for how you deal with it. All this comes together, and we start to look at the troublesome times and realize that indeed God promises to be with us he promised us to see us through but there are contingencies in what God promises and that's not what we're told everywhere every time in these days but the contingencies have not been removed 
they still are there. I've cited it several times, and I guess I shouldn't ever apologize for any passage, but sometimes it seems like we get on the habit of using one. I don't want to do that. And yet, what better one is there than the second Chronicles chapter 7, 14, when God says, if, you know that word, if, that's a contingency. If my people who are called by my name will seek my face, if they will pray, if they will repent of their sin, I will hear their prayer from heaven and I will heal their land. The contingency is spelled out more clearly, perhaps, in a passage a few chapters later, chapter 15. And I believe Jed referred to this one in one of the lessons we were in not long ago. Also, in that one, you, you've got the prophet coming to Asa and uh, telling him as long, and I'm, I, I recommend you read at least verses 1 through 4, but drop on over about verse 15 or so also. But he basically said, God was with the children of Israel as long as the children of Israel were with him. And when they were not with him, they were, he was not with them. It's contingent on faithfulness. It's contingent on keeping in the footsteps of Jesus, as it's put in regard to the New Testament. But we're just blown away when we have some troubles and struggles. Job is famous for his experience, of course. And maybe he stands kind of for all of us who are trying to do the right thing, and yet trouble came. Maybe he's the, the one that, that should have been a harbinger out front to say Satan is not going to leave you alone. And don't get into the lulled spirit that it has to be good for it to be right. That it has to be good for you to still believe and trust in God. In the third chapter of Job, verses 25 and 26, he said, For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dreaded befalls me, and I'm not at ease, and I'm not quiet, I, nor do I have rest, but trouble comes. Yes, he said, I, I feared these kinds of things. But they weren't happening. They weren't happening. Now, what I feared and what I dreaded has happened to me. And I'm not quiet. I'm not at peace. I'm not at rest. I'm, I'm in trouble here. And we realize that in this quagmire of inexperience, we are in trouble here. And we want to keep our faith. We want to be strong. We want to keep marching through and we want to keep believing and doing the right thing and enjoying the blessings of God. Job further in chapter 14 verse 1 reminds us that man that is born of woman is full of trouble. He cometh forth as a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. This isn't forever. This is not permanent. This is temporary. But in the interim, we have to understand that we are much, much better off remaining true and faithful to God whatever trouble comes, and he will help us in it. He does not ever say in the scripture that you'll never have any trial, you'll never have any trouble if you're faithful to me. He does promise that whatever the trouble is, as long as we're faithful to him, he will be with us and he will see us through. But he often reminds us that this isn't the end. The end chapter hasn't come. And so we wait. And we are quiet. And we keep on serving as best we can. There's a series of passages I want to read from the Psalms. These all are quite interesting in light of what we're dealing with and what we're addressing today. 
You may want to turn as we go along. I wrote them down so I don't have to find the passages quickly as, as we go here. The first is Psalms 9 and verse 9. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord, he's that fortress. He's that haven. He's that spot of safety. He's that storm cellar in the tornado. He is the one who's there, a stronghold in times of trouble. Psalm 27, verse 5, for he will hide me in his shelter in the time of trouble. And the 31st Psalm in verse 9, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I'm in trouble. My eyes are wasted for grief and my body and my soul also. Sometimes the psalmist said, I've just cried my eyes out. And, and I'm so tired. My body, my soul, my spirit, just, I, I'm in trouble. I need you. And so the ones that we know as being close to God, like David, the one who was so close to God, who wrote so many of the psalms, pled often also for the presence of the Lord with him. In the 37th Psalm, in verse 39, the salvation of the righteous is the Lord. He is their strength and their stronghold in a time of trouble. I never knew that phrase was used that often. So many times. But then David, of course, was in exile. David was in hiding. David was in danger. David was in many of those cases and ways. He was innocent and should not have had to have experienced those kinds of things. He did nothing to deserve most of that kind of experience. And yet those things, trouble came, trouble befell him. And the 41st Psalm, verse 1, Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. Even if troubles come, when we're doing the right thing, God will ultimately deliver us, he says. If we're conscious of those who are less blessed, those who are in need, God says, if you care for them, I'll care for you. You see, God has not left us alone. And he's not unconscious of the discomforts, the weariness that exist. And since what we deal with here in terms of personal emotion, in terms of faith being tested, is not a new thing. For if it were a new thing, it could not have been written about 3,000 years ago in the Psalms. If it were a new thing, it wouldn't be the theme of the book of Job that is said to conceivably be the oldest book of the Bible in terms of when it was written. Who knew that troubles and struggles and calamities that disturb the faithful would be such a theme through all the scriptures. And of course, we're touching some, but not all. The passage I want us to really look upon for analysis is the 77th Psalm. And I want to use all of it. Beginning in verse 1, the psalmist said, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying, and my soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled, I cannot speak. 
I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of old of the right hand of the Most High. And I'll remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I'll remember your wonderful wonders of old. I'll ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among his peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled, and the clouds poured out water, and the skies gave forth thunder, and your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind, and your lightnings lighted up the world, and the earth trembled and shook. Your way through the sea was through the sea your path through the great waters, yet your footsteps were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. What a statement. What a statement of faith, but of anxiety too, of wonder, of question, of doubt even, but of reassurance is given by this Asaph, the one who wrote this one. You see, he's saying, I, I, in verses 1 through 3, I, I think I interpret correctly that he's saying, I know that he's there. I know God's still there. Why do I doubt? Why do I have this misgiving? D does he hear me? And verse 1, does he really hear me? Today, people often come to doubt their own prayers. And they say things like, I need someone to pray for me because I feel like my prayer is not getting through the roof. It's not getting any higher than the ceiling. I feel inadequate and I need prayer, but I can't trust my own. And the psalmist seemed to be like that. Does he hear me? Does he care? We sing, don't we? Does Jesus care? Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. We need that reassurance that our prayers are not wasted. But we're struggling here. And so we confess that. And the psalmist seems at this point to me to be kind of saying something like we might say today, I, I know he's there I know he loves me, but somehow I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. I, I want that reassurance. I'm reaching out, he said, but I find no comfort. And, and just reflecting on God, he said, makes me moan. Mm. Maybe that's a reference to the same kind of thing that Paul referred to when he talked about in our prayer life that sometimes when we talk to God we cannot find words to express and the Holy Spirit intercedes with groans that we cannot interpret and here he said I am in such distress now I groan when I think of God and my heart faints within me. I can't speak. I can't find the words. In the next three verses, four through six, 
He basically said, I'm yearning for some normalcy. I'm yearning for something I can identify with and feel good about. And he spells out, I can't sleep. It's like you're holding my eyelids open. I lie down and I try to sleep, but I just worry and I just fret. I can't sleep. I can't half speak. I can't find my words. Depression does that. I don't know how to talk to you, Lord. I pine for the way it was. I, I want to get back to that. I just want to go back to where I had my songs in the night. I'm going to study that more because I think there's more there than I can cover. Well, more than I understand yet. My songs in the night. I think it refers to those times when at night we're still happy. We're still singing. And we're maybe singing, sing and be happy, sing and be happy. And we're praising God. And we wake up and there's a song on our mind. A song that praises the Lord. And he said, I want some more of that. I don't want this separation feeling. I want my songs in the night. And, and I just want to be stronger. I want to feel more like myself. In the valley of my life, I remember these kinds of feelings. And the worst thing I ever faced. And I remember looking at me, examining introspectively, and realizing I'm not who I was. And who I was is who I want to be, but I'm not there yet. I don't know how to get home. And people told me, well, it just takes time. It just takes time. But folks, sometimes it seems like time is bogged down and it stops. And the psalmist is saying, I want to get past this. Aren't you saying, I want to be past this? I want to be back when the church can meet without any green tape, any red tape. I want to get back to where <laughs> there's not a piece of tape that goes across my office door and says, danger, danger. <laughs> and I keep coming and looking at that and wondering, what does that mean? <laughs> but I haven't dared to take it down. <laughs> it must mean something. I want it gone. Don't you? I want toilet paper. I want a steak I can afford. And I want the church to be able to fill every pew, shaking hands and hugging each other. I just want it to be like it was. But I need also to remember what it was, wasn't heaven. What it was, wasn't where we're going. What it was, wasn't the last chapter. And while we welcome it back, it isn't what we're about. The future is what we're about. And this psalmist came to realize that too. He said, I didn't in anticipate all of this in verses 7 through 9. And he said, I'm, I'm made to wonder these, these great questions are on my mind. Is God ever going to bless us again? Is God going to ignore us now? Is he going to turn away? Will he ever bless us again? Has the time really come? When the steadfast love of the Lord ceases. We know that passage in the Psalms where the whole chapter has at the end of every verse, 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And the psalmist is saying, have they ended? Did it come to that? Has it gone that far? Have time and opportunity stopped? Can we no longer sing an invitation song? And say, you've got one more chance at least to respond to the Lord. Has that closed? Is this the end? Has God given up? Has he abandoned us? Has he become so angry that as in the days of the flood, he said, I'll wipe them out entirely? The psalmist is saying, has it come to that? Will he never love us again? He's really struggling with lasting questions. And finally, he comes to a remedy. He comes to a solution. He said, I'm, what I'm going to do, verses 10 through 13, is I'm going to reflect. I'm going to reflect upon my experience with God. I'm going to look back at the experience of God. We, we've had a lot of positive experiences together, you and I, God. And I, I, I'm going to ask, you know, can I just rely on, I, I'm going to get my strength from these wonders of old. I'm going to go back and consider what you've always done. I'll, rec I'll recall your mighty works. How you've always come through. How you've always made us able. I'm going to remember that there's no one like you. Where is there a God? He said it's like our God. There is none. Isaiah 40 talks about it. He's the only one. And the psalmist said, that's where I'm going to get my strength. He has always provided. I know he has. I can trust him. And so he said in verse 16 to 20, these previous crossings that you've led us through have been successful, and I think I'll get through this too. Some think that he was perhaps in exile with David in one of those times when the king was threatening all their lives and they were hid out and running from place to place and finding little rescue and hoping for better times. And he looked back. And in this last part, it's, it's like he's gaining something from David. You remember the lesson we've talked about before, that with David, when David killed the lion and the bear, that was phenomenal. But that wasn't the end of the story. Because one day, as still a boy, he went up and found Saul and his army unable to deal with a great Philistine named Goliath. And everybody was afraid to go out against him. And this young lad said, who does that Philistine think he is? I'll take him on. Saul said, you're not able, you're not big enough. He said, I killed the bear, and I killed the lion, I kill him too. And then he ran to the battle. His past experience of success. And the psalmist here is saying, I'm going to rely on the experience I've had with God up to now. I'm going to look back at these wonderful wonders of the past, of his great power and his might and his faithfulness in every way. I think in verses 16 and through 18, he's referring first to the flood because he speaks of the earth trembling and shaking and giving up its waters and of the mighty waters that came down and the thunder and the lightning and all of that. And he brought his chosen ones through. The whole earth shook, but God prevailed. At the Red Sea in verse 19, he separated the waters of the Jordan and he walked leading Moses and Aaron as they led the children of Israel through. And the psalmist said, you walked through the deep, but you didn't leave your footprints, but you led your children through. It could refer some to the wilderness wanderings that occurred thereafter in chapter 20 as he led them all the way through to the promised land. His point essentially is God has never failed. God has all power. 
God can overcome. And as long as we are continuing to rely on God and serve God faithfully, God will not leave us. His steadfast love will never cease. His blessings will never be done. But we use the occasion that could cause us to lose faith, to increase our faith. As Hebrews 11 talks about all the people who were challenged through the ages, but whose faith sustained them. Our faith supersedes everything that this world and the here and now throws at us because God is faithful as we are faithful. If you're subject to the invitation of the Lord Jesus today, if you do need prayer, if you're one who's been waiting to be baptized to become a child of God. We can tell you that today we're here and we can help you. All those weeks that we pre-recorded, all those times that we live streamed with an empty building, we really couldn't do much invitation. Today we can you need to respond to the Lord. Come and let us know how we may help you. And we will seek to do so while we stand together and sing. We invite you now.